Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining this webinar about 5G. Today, we will talk about the future of healthcare. We will give you a sneak peek into that future. We will introduce our new 5G hub, a collaboration between Vodafone Ziggo, Ericsson, Brainport Intelligence, and the High Tech Campus Eindhoven. And then we will travel in this webinar a little bit to the future, to the endless possibilities of 5G, like simulated reality, a virtual world in healthcare without any wearables. Between speakers, there will be, there will be a short Q&A, so if you have a question, just ask them and we try to answer as many questions as possible. So, I think it's time. Are you ready? Where traditionally mobile networks were used to connect people, 5G is a whole different ballgame. It transforms the mobile network into a world of business opportunities. That's why four future-minded tech parties decided to join forces and establish the first 5G hub in the Netherlands. A collaboration between Ericsson, Vodafone Zigo, High Tech Campus Eindhoven and Brainport Development. Together, we grow an ecosystem for innovation. Located on High Tech Campus Eindhoven, we focus on three areas. Business, for instance, by monitoring and optimizing production environments. Entertainment, think of using drones to enhance events and control crowds. And health, because 5G enables remote healthcare when every second counts, saving valuable time and even lives. Together, we can accelerate your biggest business ambitions. Is this the first step of a project everybody is talking about? Connecting 5G with other technologies will get us there. Starting from the heart of the Brainport region, the future is shaping right here. Our results and discoveries contribute to a better world by using tech for good. Are you ready to join? Hello, everybody. My name is Stefan Kreine. Welcome to everybody on the webinar. Thanks for joining us. Hundreds of registrants are also across the Netherlands uh, joining in this session. Very good. My name is Stefan Kreine. I work for Ericsson as 5G and IoT Business Development Manager. Uh, together with Vodafone, Ericsson, High Tech Compass and Brainport Development, we have to, uh, uh, to undertaken the initiative to deploy the 5G hub. What is it? As you can see on the picture, it is located here at the High Tech Compass in Eindhoven. It's a 700 square meter facility where we have every 5G technology currently on the market available for you to explore, for you to co-create with us and develop new initiatives. Because the world is going digital and we are exploring the digital transformation in health, entertainment and business. All right. We do that by using many, many ecosystem partners, potentially you guys in the medtech sector, in the healthcare, in this industry, because health is a very important sector for us. Um, it's here on the high-tech campus, Hall uh, 25, uh, the, um, building number three. And here we are have co-creation facilities and equipment available for you guys to work with. And as I mentioned, health is one of the main topics here. An example, together with Philips and Vodafone Zigo, um, Maxima Ziekenhuis and Katharine Zakel uh, um, Hospital, we have developed uh, the connected ambulance. Let me show you a video about that one. Imagine a world where the survival rate of cardiac arrest and other acute health problems is dramatically higher than it is today. Well, that world could be just around the corner. 5G is being rolled out in the Netherlands. It's faster, safer and more reliable. Philips, Vodafone, Ericsson, GGD and Maxima Hospital have joined forces to use 5G for good. Integrated images, sound and data connection between the incident site, ambulance and hospital will open the door to a range of functionalities. Onboard medical monitoring functions in cars could trigger quick responses. From AED drones, ambulances that have their route cleared by smart traffic systems, and emergency doctors assisting through video connections. 
We're only just scratching the surface of the exciting opportunities that lie ahead. 5G can make a life-changing difference and we are working on it. Yeah, so you see, we think 5G has the ability to transform many industries, healthcare in particular. We are already seeing many innovations coming to life when it comes to wearables, communication in hospitals, in between hospitals, in the home care, and also, of course, in the emergency care, as you have just seen. So a whole revolution, and here in the Brainport region, there are more than 400 companies working in that sector, doing innovations in this area on a daily basis. And this webinar is also intended as a reach out to all of those medtech companies that want to co-create and innovate together with us. Reach out to us. But let me introduce to you uh, today the uh, speakers we have lined up for you. As I said, it's not only about in the hospitals. We have Gertjan Elzinga from Strict, managing partner of Strict, telling, will there even be hospitals like we know them today? What is going on over there? But also in between hospitals, how do you, in example, during pandemics, can get some assurance that all the connectivity across borders will, will work? Have quite a technical 5G-related story, um, which is a prize-winning catalyst at Telecom Management Forum, um, will be per, uh, presented by Marco Gatti. And we have home care. So when more and more care is given in the home, how do we really assure that all the care is given in a fair way. We have Marcel Dame, the founder of Horizon Internet Technologies and Fair Care Solutions on stage with us, telling a little bit about how he can use blockchain and IoT to facilitate the assurance that everything is done in a proper manner. And last and definitely not least, we have uh, Iona uh, Moruta from Dimenko talking about simulated reality. Imagine a world where you can interact with models without having to wear wearables. An amazing story. Okay. Coventry University is always looking at ways of pushing the boundaries of teaching and learning to improve the student experience. This is the first time that 5G standalone technology has been used commercially in the UK. I can put the VR headset on and 5G allows the learner to access high resolution images and videos remotely anywhere in the world and they're able to ask questions in real time. This experience allows us to take a tour through the human body at a level we've never been able to before. All the way through from bones, muscles, brain, heart, through to the very smallest areas such as the blood cells. I've just experienced a live VR lesson for the first time and I think it's a great addition to the school syllabus. 5G delivers a lot more capacity, a lot faster uplink and downlink speeds, 10 times more than 4G. So the lower the latency, the closer you are to a real life experience. CloudXR is a really exciting new software platform that enables us to stream high fidelity virtual reality directly to the headset. 5G standalone is independent from 4G, relying on a completely 5G architecture that enables us to configure network slices dedicated for specific applications like remote surgery, remote monitoring of equipment, remote diagnostics will all be possible due to the ultra-reliable low latency. Okay. Oh. And this 5G standalone you've been uh, hearing about, it's available at the 5G Hub 2. So every medtech company out there can join us. Every company that wants to innovate can join the 5G Hub and start co-creating with us together. Go to our website where you can fill in your contact details and we'll get in touch with you or follow us, everything that we do on the 5Ghub.nl LinkedIn. And with that, I'd like to give the word back to Inge Loon. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. I'll get the clicker from you. Thank you. I will clean this 
of course, because of COVID-19. So I think we are ready for, uh, for our first in-depth speaker, and it's all about the hospitals. What will they look like? Will there even be hospitals in five years from now? So Gert-Jan Elzega is going to talk about that. So give him a very big applause here in the room and also at home. Okay. Thank you, Ingeloo. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. I would like to take you in the coming minutes um, and spend time on the vision. Will there still be hospitals as we know them today, within five years from now? What we've seen is that there is a continuous flow of innovation ongoing at the moment. But still, there is a system where doctors and nurses are working in hospitals um, in a centralized way. The future is going to change that in a way we cannot believe. We will see new concepts of treatments, new treatments domestically, locally, um, which will all change the hospital environments to a situation we cannot think of today. A brief introduction. My name is Gert-Jan Elzinga. I'm managing partner at Strict, and I have a warm feeling for healthcare because it's about people and about technology. And there is a vibrant atmosphere of innovation and improvement. About my company. Strict is an independent consultancy company consisting of 120 consultants who share a passion to make technology work for people and for organizations. And that's the reason why we like to be part of the 5G hub. Um, and we're there um, uh, in, a, in a specific connection. We are the proud innovation partner for the organizations depicted here and for some 30-odd more cure and care facilities. Let's look at the environment. What entrance, new entrance, do we see coming into the marketplace? We see, for example, Apple. Apple in healthcare. Apple is launching medical clinics to deliver medical experiences to its employees. We see a sister company of Google called Verily, and they're entering into the insurance industry. Another example is Google itself. Google is rolling out a new tool for medical administration. And we see Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan going into the um, partnering on US employee health care. Amazing developments. Keywords for the future are e-health and home healthcare. An advocate for innovation in the Netherlands is Professor Jan Kramer. He is a professor in patient innovation at the Radboud University Medical Center and also a chairman of the Dutch Healthcare Quality Board. And his vision is stop getting stuck on measuring quality, but start to improve. And here you see technological improvements such as medication administration and monitoring. You see monitoring of central functions and you see um, telehealth care, teleconsulting. Home is the best healing environment ever. What we see is that patients get well sooner in their own home environment. Let's have a closer look at what developments are supporting this. We see measuring of data and sharing of data online that helps people to have quicker access to healthcare uh, without having to visit a hospital. And they will be more actively involved themselves in the cure of their disease. And now I would like to ask you a question here in the audience. Um, if you'd visit your GP, what would be the first question he would ask you? Anyone? How are you doing? Is what Wana says. And in fact, that's what it is. What would you think is the matter with you? So what, what will happen is that you will investigate yourself about your disease before you go to the doctor. Um, and we see many innovations and appointments and treatments examples that are done remotely already. Um, we see, of course, 
video consulting, uh, and we see monitoring of even critical functions like heart, heart rates, lung function, and so forth. And now it's time for a little comic. We should not overdo this. Be careful, be realistic. And now I have some time for a couple of use cases. Some of the use cases are already available and being further developed. Other ones are for the farther future. The first one is teleophthalmology, an eye doctor in English. And what you see is that fundus screening, especially focusing at the retina, um, is performed today by the first line already, which is done more dispersed and more locally than it used to be, uh, enabling better access for people closer to their homes. And if an anomaly is detected, what you'll see is that a GP will make an appointment at the teleophthalmology consultancy practice, sending in the data of his patient, and the ophthalmologist is capable to respond already in two days, having the information available. And that used to be a period of four to six weeks. So this is a tremendous improvement. Another example is telepulmonology. What you see here is that real-time data is gathered at home and shared with the hospital, which, makes, which enables the patient to cure at home. And then there is an example, a totally different example, of wearable technology. This is in fact haptic technology. Pauline van Dongen is a fashion designer, and Pauline is working in, on development of wearable technology. She has been exhibiting last week at the Dutch Design Week, right around the corner here in Eindhoven, in fact, um, with the project called Body Wonders. And Body Wonders is a haptic vest, depicted here, carrying 14 vibration engines, and it enables you to, to give the sensation of being touched. And that's amazing. If you look at this in times of corona, um, then you know that people are developing some sort of skin hunger. The, the, the want to be touched, the want to be close. And of course, this is artificial, but still it fulfills, fulfills a need. Another good example of this is um, a shirt that helps you breathing more effectively, and a belt uh, with engines in it um, that help people with vestibular organ diseases to keep a better balance. And then an example is augmented reality. Well, we all know augmented reality, and this is an example of commercial vessels. What you see is that if people fall ill at such a vessel, the shipping company has to bring in doctors by helicopter, and that's both time-consuming and costly. And what you see in this example is that with the use of AR, it is possible to bring in um, the knowledge towards a medical skilled crew member assisted by a doctor remotely. The next slide is on the intelligent contact lens. A very interesting project by Verily, the sister company from Google. And what we see is that this company has um, tried to bring in a lens that measures glucose levels. And these glucose levels were sent to patient records. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, this project. It was halted, and it has now evolved into a project where a lens is developed to help people recover from cataract surgery. Cataract is stag in Dutch. There's also an example, in a more general sense, that such a lens is developed um, for AR purposes. Um, in fact, preventing you from having to wear these big helmet-like uh, stuff on your head. Then an example about artificial intelligence. You see here an example of an X-ray photo with a doctor pointing at an anomaly. And um, in fact, he's feeding this data into machine learning, improving the algorithms, helping artificial intelligence to detect the anomalies itself. And you see many examples of artificial intelligence already in healthcare, such as an early detection of Alzheimer or um, verification of lung cancer um, and other examples. An investigation of the above-mentioned four organizations uh, on health 
and on IT systems in healthcare, has proven that the learning curve in 90%, 90 plus percent of all cases was both there for medical staff and patients. And that the response time went down from six to eight weeks to only 4.6 hours. And 74% less hospital referrals all lead to a cost reduction of 20 to 40%. Now, if you consider that our GDP um, uh, level is 18% 18, 18 of our GDP is spent on healthcare, you can imagine the enormous saving potential this brings. Introduction of IT and e health in the healthcare has been tremendously accelerated by Corona. You see here that in 2019, 10 to 15% of all the patients visited the patient portal. Only 10% of chronic patients shared measured data, and less than 5% uh, did video calling. And today, that has changed. 64% of GPs started video calling. It's amazing. Recurring drug prescriptions are administered online now, much more. Digital, digital triage is ongoing, and we see more than 200,000 visitors each day on the portal thuisarts.nl. Let me go to a wrap-up of my presentation with some facts and consequences. We see a shift towards health and prevention in society. Um, and what we see is, for example, if you choose a new healthcare insurance, you'll probably get a free admission to the gym. We see lots of data uh, available, but too, far too little information. So it's difficult um, to make choices for next steps. We see many innovations. We also see the right care in the right place, and it comes twofold. First of all, you see specialization in hospitals, such as cancer hospitals like Antoni van Leeuwenhoek, Princess Maxima Center. You will also see um, St. Anna for orthopedics. And you will see that the right care can also be given at home. So there's a shift from healthcare from the institution towards home. The patient actively will take control um, about his own disease and the cure he wants to follow and the institution that can help him with that. And that brings me to my conclusion. We will end up with far less, more specialized and smaller hospitals in the end. Uh, that's going to be the future. And well, one important link to what we're here for today is in fact, what is the absolute prerequisite to achieve that? And that is connectivity. For all the examples mentioned, connectivity is key. And this connectivity should be reliable, sufficient and secure, because after all, we're talking about people, people's health. And with that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you. Thank Hello. you, Gert Jan. Thank you, you very go. much. Thank you. So, thank you for these useful insights and, and an interesting look into the future. So, uh, my pleasure. Strict is also partnering with the 5G Hub. Can Definitely. you tell us why? Yeah, certainly. Um, happy to. We are, in fact, uh, we have a passion about technology. We like to make it work for organizations. And what you see in the 5G Hub, the 5G Hub is like a melting pot uh, or a candy store, if you like, um, of all things which are important in this 5G and technological and, and society developments. So we see, the, the, we see new questions arising, new ideas, uh, new, new topics, uh, we see new technology, and it all comes together in this 5G hub. So this is a good place for strict, a good platform to be part of. Okay. And, and what if some med tech company or hospital is watching and thinking, uh, I really want to do something with 5G, but I don't know where to start. Do you have advice for them? Oh yes, definitely. What I would say is um, start small, um, and think big. What, what you should do, in fact, is work, work on what will be the future, what is the idea, what would you like to achieve in the end, after three or five years from now. That is your dream. And how can you achieve that and bring that down to feasible steps? Um, and in fact, if I'm totally honest, I don't think that such an institution will ask for 5G in the first place. They will probably try to improve processes. Um, have incidents, um, try, to, try, try to innovate, uh, and that will usually be the driver from healthcare or from the business that really drives the change, and 5G can be a perfect answer for that. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much and thank you for joining. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So, our next speaker of the day is Marco Gatti of Ericsson. We already talked about connectivity and he knows a lot more about that. So, thank you for joining. Thank you. And good luck. Thank you. Okay. So, um, today I'm going to speak to you about the project that we are uh, executing uh, with uh, an important initiative for, tele for telecommunications that is the Telemanagement Forum. Telemanagement Forum is holding every year a conference that is called the Digital Transformation World. And in this conference, they have a project that they called Catalysts. And Catalysts is uh, quite close to what is happening here at the 5G Hub. Catalysts are meant to bring companies together, work on innovative topics, uh, and try to figure out uh, how the future of the topic will look like. Now, uh, as you can see here, we have uh, the Catalyst, uh, phase two and three, that we call the uh, Skynet and Ghost in the Shell. And uh, phase two and three means that it's three years that we are working uh, with uh, a large number of companies on uh, healthcare topics related to connectivity. And specifically, how can we uh, use connectivity to enable worldwide collaboration uh, on uh, healthcare? Uh, as you can see below, we have really large number of companies. It was uh, 17, year, 17, 17 companies last year and 14 companies this year, including three universities. So we really try to get uh, the wider um, understanding of, uh, of the need. And uh, we work for confirmation of our conclusion with major telco worldwide, with Vodafone, uh, with Orange, with NTT, with Deutsche Telekom. So really a lot of them. Now, uh, we started, why, why this topic of healthcare is so interesting for uh, telecommunication companies and also for the hospital themselves, why they should invest in connectivity. Uh, there are analyses, there are studies that uh, demonstrate and uh, uh, forecast that there are a huge amount of revenues coming for the telco companies that invest uh, in uh, producing uh, products for healthcare consumption that, uh, as you can see here, the estimate is about 75 billion US dollars worldwide by 2026. That means it is a massive market. But also, on the other end, there is huge savings for the healthcare industry uh, as well. So uh, the forecast is that the healthcare industry will save overall uh, 90 billion US dollars by 2030 if they invest uh, in uh, using more connectivity and 5G technologies. So I think that that is uh, really a good reason why we should look more deeply in this and why we should uh, analyze how to make this real. Uh, on, the, on the bottom right, you see also that I mentioned B2B2X. B2B2X uh, is a different kind of business model where your healthcare product is uh, sold uh, by a telco party, for example. So imagine you're a startup and you want to sell uh, your products. Uh, you can go on the market yourself. That might be problematic, difficult, uh, it's challenging. Or you can uh, also invest in, a, for example, a telco operator that uh, sell the product for you, giving you the connectivity as well. So it's like a sort of indirect sale that uh, might benefit uh, also the proliferation of multiple products uh, used for healthcare. Now, as mentioned, this is a three years journey. Uh, it was uh, quite, uh, quite complex. We started from a technological base in 2018. Uh, last year, we uh, extended it with a uh, uh, more solid basis. We really created a blueprint that uh, was looking at, okay, how do I do the fulfillment? How do I put in, co in contact uh, two operators that are on two different countries? Uh, uh, how do we ensure that you get those ultra-reliable connectivity for critical services with the right performances for the services that you want to use? And uh, that was last year. This year, we went a bit deeper. So we wanted to, we focused even a bit more on how do you assure this connectivity? Because we said, OK, these are medical services. You might have a remote surgery running on that. You cannot go out of connectivity for one minute while your uh, uh, virtual machine or while your container is restarting or is fixing an issue. The connectivity must be ultra reliable. That must be by contract. The technology need to make sure that that is executed and uh, so that you as a healthcare user, you don't have to worry about that. You just buy the ultra reliable connectivity and you know that that is happening and that is, uh, makes life simpler. We will see later that uh, that also makes 
simple life for developers because they are trying to find workarounds on, uh, on this connectivity. So they are trying to make their product more complex. That means more costly, more effort, and more troubles when uh, they could fix it at the lower layer of uh, telecommunication. So, uh, the start discussion from last year, we were using, uh, actually, it's with a bad timing, we were using a pandemic topic. So, we, took, uh, we analyzed the Ebola uh, epidemic of 2008. We watched the paper, we tried to analyze what was happening and uh, what were the needs and the problems that uh, uh, they were being faced in the healthcare industry at that time. And we collaborated with uh, doctors in Ivory Coast and in India to get uh, their real life experience on uh, what they would want, how that could improve. So the things that we concluded is that there was a need to create a network of hospitals. It was not about the telco, it's about the hospitals. The hospitals need to communicate to another hospital to get the right expertise as fast as possible to cure somebody. So, as simple as that. But this network of hospital is not there, is not existing. So they needed to fly doctors with the right expertise to the location, and the doctor, of course, then it was uh, in a location hit by epidemic, so he couldn't travel back. That is expensive, that is slow, that is not efficient. That is where we try to figure out how we could improve that uh, relation. So the first thing that we put is that, okay, a doctor is not a person with technology expertise, or at least not telecommunication technology expertise. So they will need to talk to a layer of communication that talks medical language. They want to buy medical expertise, maybe from that country, maybe from that doctor, maybe from that hospital, because they published a paper. So it's, it, there is a different way of thinking that we used to think in technology. So we need to start exposing a layer of medical language to these hospitals so that they can uh, relate with that and they can uh, buy the right thing for them. This layer, of course, we said you need to buy the right expertise, maybe from another country, maybe from another hospital. So it means that these layers need to communicate with each other. So below is where we have the telco layer. Telcos are already in communication. They already have services going across multiple countries. They're already talking to each other. There is uh, even uh, a part of the legal uh, clearance to get this connectivity in place that uh, it's already figured out. So why not for using it? That is uh, as simple as that. And uh, these telco, they already have the mesh network of contract between each other so that they can communicate uh, in a very, very fast way. And that, why that is important? Because uh, the, one of the things that came out from the epidemic analysis is that you don't know when the next outbreak of a pandemic is going to happen. So it could be, in, in this case, it started from Italy, sadly, but uh, it's, uh, you, you don't know where that is coming. It can come uh, from Ivory Coast, like it was in Ebola, it can come uh, from Italy, it can come from China. You, you don't know, and you need to be ready in advance. So that's why you need to reuse this mesh network of a connectivity. But for these advanced services, uh, you need really high-performing network. High-performing network are super expensive. They need to be ultra-reliable. You might need uh, backup connectivity uh, for specific cases. That is expensive. So this connectivity needs to be on demand. You cannot keep it instantiated forever. You cannot create uh, a mesh network with this super high-performing uh, uh, connection uh, forever, you need to have that on demand when you need it, and it needs to be instantiated as fast as possible. So that is where we uh, built the blueprint last year. Now, so we work also with universities. Uh, we validated this year with three universities. Uh, we have the University of Milano that uh, was building up uh, a virtual reality uh, visualization for organs. They have uh, scans of organs. They plan to have scans of organs from real patients so that when you have a doctor that needs to perform a surgery, it can uh, see in virtual reality the organ and in the future the organ of that patient so that he can uh, visualize it in a, in a much more practical way, and uh, uh, it can uh, 
it can work better, is a reference that is important for them. We have the AI counseling from the Meiji University in Tokyo, and the AI counselor is, um, uh, the idea is that if there is a disaster event, like a earthquake, you get people from every, um, every nationality, and uh, you need to talk with them with their own language. And uh, if there is something happening, like it happened in uh, Southeast Asia, and you have Japanese uh, patients, you need to talk with them in, ja in, in Japanese to make some sort of psychological counseling. And that is not possible today. They just try to figure out what it is without speaking the language. And then the last one was with the University of Paris. We tried to uh, figure out how you can train doctors and uh, uh, in, in the fastest way possible when the expertise for a specific topic is in a different country. So how do you do the remote training? This, in this moment, in the hospital, medical trainings are performed on site. So the expert, the doctor, is on site, and that is it. You, we can see it here, it's in, actually in this picture. Uh, the doctor is just sitting in the next room. You know, that is 2020 is not acceptable. You should uh, have access to the best teacher on the planet, and the best teacher on the planet should be able to teach to the, uh, to the students in the fastest way possible without moving, and that is where you have access to expertise. So, technique, how do we do, how do, we do it? We figure out that in order to connect uh, two countries, you need at least three parties involved, at least. You need a lead service provider, uh, that is the provider that has the connectivity with the final customer for the service, the, the entity that needs the service. You need a last mile service provider that is where the expertise is for that specific uh, uh, technology. It could be the doctor, but could be the uh, AI counseling. Uh, and you need a transit provider that connects both of them. So it's, uh, that's, those are the three basic building blocks. Moreover, you see here at the border, you, these technologies could be also different. You can have a you know, very advanced country with 5G, you can have a less advanced country with a 3G or fixed line. Uh, that, uh, that, and you make, this, is, this needs to work even in this situation. 5G to 5G is better, of course, but it needs to work anyway. This year, we also included the applications. So the applications usually, from a telco perspective, are considered uh, less or less understood, and that uh, for us was a big step forward because that allowed us to understand what are the real needs. You know, what is the expect... And, and one of the uh, really surprising stuff is that the application, uh, they, they work on best effort network. You know, they, when we explain that you can have not best effort network, but a fastest network on demand for your need, maybe even cheaper, that was a bit of a surprise to them, because then it uh, allows them to think, OK, then I can build up my application in a different way. I can make them uh, smarter, and I can make them more uh, efficient. Now, I skip a bit maybe the architecture part, but we studied on the architecture, the APIs that uh, goes for the connectivity. Two, and also you see here in the application there is not yet standard. There are a few of them, but they are not really well known, they are not really used. It's a pity we want to push a lot more the industry standard to, uh, to work more on this, to make these applications more reliable. We think that that can help also the spread of application worldwide. You build up an application in the Netherlands, you can set it everywhere, because there is a standard for managing this connectivity. And the conclusion, in the end, is that you know, there are a number of technical conclusions on where the standards are missing, where the standard needs to be improved. But at the end is that this 5G connectivity is really moving forward to uh, enable what the healthcare industry needs in order to work uh, better. So I think that it was uh, quite uh, amazing that uh, the, the response that we got from the universities that this is, this is what they need. This is uh, what they're looking for. And uh, they don't know that this is coming. We explained to them that this is coming, and now they're thinking even forward on how they could uh, manage different IT workloads uh, using 5G, using Edge, and it's, uh, it's really improving their way of, uh, of building up healthcare applications that are going to be used in the next years. And that's, uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. So, so if we look at the, the concept, how far from reality is this? 
This is, uh, this is not too far. It depends by the maturity of the operator themselves. So this is actually all the tools, all the network and the IT tools are ready to be used. We build up demos on this. So this, is, this could work today. Uh, the uh, industry is not there yet. We are building it. We think that based on the maturity of the operator and based on their strategy plans, it can go anywhere from six to five years, six months to five years. So it could be really, really quick in some countries. You can have it available uh, six months from now, that is today, or you can have it available uh, in a lot longer time frame based on uh, the maturity. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and um, the feedback you received so far from healthcare vendors, for example? This is, uh, this is what they're waiting for, uh, apparently. They, we had a funny discussion with universities even, because they were asking us, what are the APIs? How can I connect? You know, I want to use it uh, now. Send me the API tab so that I can start using it today. And it was a bit difficult to explain to them that uh, this is not there yet. It's too we, soon. It's yeah. too soon. You need to yeah. push to have it because uh, this is possible. And this is uh, absolutely uh, within our capabilities today. But we need to, we need to make it, uh, make it production. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Joining. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> so, we're going to talk about fair care. Marcel Dame of Horizon Internet Technologies and also Fair Care Solutions is going to talk with us about that. So, welcome in on stage. Give him a very big applause, please. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the invite on the 5G uh, hub on the high tech campus. Um, my presentation today, the next uh, 12 minutes, is about uh, how to use innovative technology to validate and control healthcare budgets. That's the prime thing. But apart from that, I'd like to focus also on how 5G can accelerate home care services. Uh, my name is Marcel Damen. I am from Horizon Internet uh, Technologies and from Fair Care Solutions. Um, I have 30 years experience uh, and background in the telecommunications and IT industry. And um, I experienced a lot, uh, particularly over the last couple of years, that um, many good ideas often don't get past a conceptual phase. So often, uh, particularly uh, technical people, uh, come up with all kinds of ideas on how we can uh, implement innovations, increase efficiency, effectivity in the various processes. But whenever you try to take that into a next phase, it often stops for various reasons. So I decided at a certain stage to uh, start my own company about three years ago uh, with the prime focus on bridging the gap between conceptual innovations and true life solutions. So the team that is within Horizon Internet Technology and Fair Care Solutions is a team that really can build end-to-end uh, -end integration based solutions. Um, and actually the first thing that we built was uh, shortly after I met uh, one of the directors of the uh, Association of Dutch Municipalities. And as it often goes, uh, when we were having a beer, he explained me about uh, the true issue we have in the Netherlands on how to control uh, the budgets for home care services. There's a huge amount of companies, there's a huge amount of responsibilities within, the, within this domain. And particularly because of changing responsibilities and changing laws, it often ends up in uh, a complete disaster on how to control that from a financial perspective. So he asked me, can you think of a combination of technology where we can better control these types of services within our company, or sorry, within our country? So Faircare is an innovative solution uh, built upon the combination of distributed and decentralized IT infrastructures, particularly blockchain technology, and cellular and sensor uh, technology, um, mobile telephones and IoT. To give you an idea of what's currently ongoing within the Netherlands in the healthcare landscape. Um, from a financial perspective, there is basically four different types of getting the finance in place. The first one is from a ministry, uh, ministry uh, perspective. The second one is municipalities. Third one, obviously, we have the insurances companies, and then there is uh, the private sector. They 
take care of two different types of healthcare services, mainly to be categorized as cure and care. And underneath, there's a huge amount of different service providers in the Netherlands that are um, providing these kind of healthcare services. You can obviously think of hospitals, institutions, doctors, pharmacies, home care service providers, therapists, but there's many others that have a certain responsibility within this domain. And like said, then there is continuously change in laws and responsibilities within this domain. And to focus a little bit on that, on the changing laws and responsibilities, and to give you an idea of the size of what's going on in the Netherlands, from a financial perspective, the total budget is approximately 100 billion euro on a yearly basis. So that's the total budget for healthcare, healthcare services in the Netherlands. A major change uh, happened in 2015, whereas the responsibilities for home care services were transferred from a centralized, centralized approach into a municipality-driven approach. So basically, we went from one centralized organization that were taking care of uh, organizing healthcare or home care services in the Netherlands towards a setup where from 2015 onwards, it moved into 380 municipalities that had to take their own responsibility to organize the home care services within their uh, municipality boundaries. Apart from that, the demand for home care services in the Netherlands is increasing extremely uh, rapidly. Um, and uh, since then, because of the growth and because of the change in responsibilities from a centralized approach into a, a municipality-driven approach, the amount of service providers in the, uh, in the Netherlands uh, 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 grow uh, with approximately 50 times. So there's certain cities that I'm uh, providing services with or that we are cooperating with, and in just a few years' time frame, the amount of service providers for home care services um, uh, grow from 120 to 6,000 6, in just a few years' time frame. This resulted in Nowadays, approximately 137,000 uh, healthcare providers in the Netherlands. And you can imagine that controlling the budget for these type of services is extremely uh, difficult, both from a quantity perspective as from a quality perspective. This has now, and this is extremely difficult to get hold of the figures though, but it is estimated uh, that this leads to approximately 1 billion euro on a yearly basis of registered fraud. But actually this morning I read an article coming from one of the ministries where they were talking about between one and five percent that is now recognized as a, as a figure uh, of registered fraud in the healthcare sector. So between one and five billion euro on a yearly basis. So what are we doing with Faircare? It's not like the title of the webinar is saying it's the future of health. But it's a system, it's a solution where we financially enable the future of health. Because basically what we're doing with fair care is that we ensure that the money is spent on the right level of services, both from a quantity as from a quality perspective. So what are we doing? It is a for the chain, for the entire chain, transparent and indisputable system, that's the blockchain component, for monitoring and validating the performance of home care services versus the contractual agreements. This means that um, if from a municipality or from a uh, insurances company, there's an approval that a individual can uh, organize home care services uh, within their environment, then from that on, it is made transparently clear about uh, how the money is spent within the eventual, uh, in, in, in eventually in the contract. So basically what we're doing is that we register how the contract is set up and eventually how it is executed from both a quality as a quantitative perspective. So we store the information into the blockchain. We have apps and sensors available that we can measure whether the healthcare service at home is really provided. And the client who has received the service has a uh, app available where they can give feedback about the quality eventually uh, experienced. This means that we got a huge amount of data available. The data is more or less real-time. 
So basically we got an overview of the deliveries at one o'clock in the afternoon, which is going until that morning. And at seven o'clock in the evening, all the information is accurately available until that day. And if you look in the current system for, mo both, or for most of the municipalities, then often the accuracy of the data available goes uh, in like two or three months. So basically here on the same day, you can see whether the service is, has been delivered according to the agreed contract and whether the, uh, the client is um, uh, satisfied about the received service. There's a portal available so that you can um, look in the, uh, in the data and apart from that we have export functions where we take references of different databases that you can combine in creating business intelligence overviews. So, at the moment, Faircare is live in approximately five municipalities amongst 3,000 clients, so it is a live solution. We are rolling out in another uh, six municipalities, and the interesting thing is that other companies are trying to approach us to make uh, or become part of the chain. So we're currently talking with a hospital that wants to become part of the chain, and we're talking to accountants, uh, we're talking to people that would like to uh, increase the quality measurement, all these kind of things. Starting with innovations, though, uh, is, is a rocky road every now and then, right? So uh, when you start uh, working with these kind of uh, more or less immature technologies, you learn a lot. So the first thing we learned is that implementing a production grade and scalable blockchain infrastructure is extremely difficult from a technical perspective. The second thing is that blockchain is to be set up amongst a consortium of various organizations within the chain. And not every organization is willing to take the responsibility within that blockchain environment. So that's another thing that you need to take care of. Uh, the Internet of Things is not mature yet. I mean, particularly on the sensor, battery capacity, all these kind of things. You are dealing with uh, Internet service providers that you need to take care of, nor the business models. I mean, if, if, uh, if you look at uh, the business model related to that the entire chain is to get a fair share of, uh, of, of, of the, the revenue, then it's extremely difficult to translate that within the healthcare sector. Apart from that, most domotica suppliers have a fragmented or lacking operational model, and often not very secure yet. And usability for non-technical users is absolutely key. So that's something that you really need to start off uh, from within the beginning to make sure that uh, all the usage uh, throughout these kind of home care solutions are extremely easy to use. So what can we do in order to accelerate uh, the home care services if we combine 5G with solutions like uh, fair care? Well, the most important thing I would say is that we absolutely need to ensure that always on and full geographical coverage is, uh, is achieved. So that's absolutely a must. I mean, within this uh, environment, people are traveling all over the country to provide their services. If you want uh, these, uh, the acceptance of these services uh, in a proper way, then you need to make sure that the coverage uh, through, uh, throughout the entire country is there. Low, low latency in case of healthcare events, obviously. Disruptive end-to-end -end service driven business models. End-to-end -end security. Uh, there's many sensors becoming part of home environments that might really jeopardize your solution for these kind of uh, total uh, setups. But once we get that in place, then uh, the maturing of 5G uh, network functionality uh, and fair care absolutely helps to, to connect domotica wearables to professional healthcare services. Thank you, uh, Marcel. So you told that Faircare is now live in five municipalities. Uh, how do they react? Well, actually, uh, most of the uh, municipalities that are using it are extremely enthusiastic. The thing is that uh, within the Netherlands, particularly from next year onwards, each municipality has the responsibility to check uh, and to validate uh, the, the deliveries of the home care services. And so far, they hardly have any tools to, to do that. So Faircare is giving them a very accurate tool to really monitor both from a financial perspective as from a quality perspective whether the, the, the service that is to be provided is according expectations. You also told about your long uh, experiences and how long you've been working in this sector. If you think about 5G, what are your future dreams then? Well, like I said, I mean, this is a network technology uh, basically that's, all, that's, that's focusing all on, on all kind of uh, additional functionality. But the key thing here is that we need 
uh, always on and full geographical uh, uh, coverage once we want to achieve full acceptance of these kind of services. So that's pretty a basic thing. Apart from that, um, uh, the operational models of 5G, once it is in relation to a, a good business model, can really take away a lot of hassle that we would experience with home care services if we have to do to deal with all the individual service providers, internet service providers. Because then you never know what kind of network that you're connected to. So if we've got a very good business model of technology 5G in combination with a uh, uh, a business model that we can use throughout the entire ch uh, chain, then particularly the operational component when using 5G could really uh, accelerate these type of services and solve a lot of operational issues that are currently often not taken into consideration. So that's why you're, what you're waiting for? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for joining. You're welcome. Can I have your clicker, please? Yeah. Thank you so much. So it's time for our last speaker. Thank you that you're watching so far our very interesting seminar about 5G and all the possibilities. So I already mentioned a little bit about the simulated reality without wearables. And Joana Marleta is going to talk about that from Limenco. Give her a very big applause, please. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, I really appreciate your time, also uh, the ones that are in distance there. Uh, so yes, I'm here today to offer you an overview about how simulated reality is reshaping the future of healthcare. Uh, so I come from uh, the company called Dimenco. A, sm a small, tiny introduction from them. And actually, before we start this presentation, I want you guys to remember two words. So please, through the presentation, always remember them, repeat them without wearables or without headsets, the one that is easier for you. Uh, Dimenko, who is Dimenko? Well, we are a spin of Philips. Uh, we are a tech company. We are based in the Netherlands, so we are actually here in Veldtoven, five minutes far away from the high-tech campus, so very close by. Uh, we are a tech company with more than 28 brilliant minds that is developing this technology every moment as we speak. And what else? We have a dream. We have a dream, and that's the, uh, providing you guys an immersive experience without any wearables. And that experience should be totally undistinguishable from reality. It's big words, but we are on the right track. So I speak with a lot of clients. I speak with a lot of people, and I understand a bit of their wishes. Sometimes maybe they are a bit hidden. But I heard that a lot of people want to step inside words that is very hard to, be, to access. So for instance, yourself, you can ask, uh, you can ask uh, yourself, have you ever wished uh, to see, for instance, the behavior of a cell and to really see it inside and then zoom in, zoom out, then really get inside of, of a cell? Or for instance, I spoke with a lot of surgeons and they would like to totally step inside and be part of the patient body and be able to do some sort of even remote surgery without being limited to distance. So if the theater is in China and the poor surgeon cannot travel either because of COVID or whatever, they still want to do the surgery. So it should not be a reason to not do the surgery because of the physical barriers. How can we do that? So these are some questions, probably you have many more. Um, so a bit, of, yeah, a bit of insight about simulated reality. You are not here today to, to actually experience it yourself. So this is the closest what I can bring it to you at the moment. So you can see this heart is pretty realistic and uh, it, it turns around and then it moves and it, it actually totally comes out of the screen. I know it sounds crazy, but it happens. So whenever we go back to normal rhythm, I hope you guys all have an experience uh, uh, with our device. But this is just a tiny piece. Again, if you are more curious, please look on, on, our, on our website. We have many more. But yeah, so this is totally an experience indistinguishable from reality. So basically, simulated reality helps to, to, it kind of triggers your imagination, right? Sometimes it's just hard. To, to imagine abstract concepts. I have a lot of troubles imagining abstract concepts. So all of this biological data, for instance, that you are dealing with it every day while you are in the hospital, that could get a shape. That could have a, a, a real depth. 
uh, to the point that your, your brain just understands because it associates with aspects from your real world. So there's no effort, right, to, to understand what's going on in that 2D screen. No, we have a transition that it goes from 2D screen, and then you literally get that depth and those images coming out of the screen. So I hope that helps a bit. Again, I know that words don't make justice, experience is the best, so let's see how we solve that. Simulated reality, just, they are just a mix of advanced components, right? I will go very quickly through it because I think this is, you know, for who are interested, please give me a call. But basically, this system is a combination of, of advanced components. We are using a lenticular lens, it's bonded on the top of the display. We are using an eye tracking system, we track the eyes of the person in front. We are using also a uh, hand tracking, also for, for the interaction with the objects or with the environment, um, but without any plus or anything like that. So you keep it just very natural, you can move your head, it doesn't really matter. If you want to see it from an angle, let's say that you want to move a bit like this, to the right or to the left, the angles, the depth of the image keeps adapted to the movement of your eyes. Um, that's, that combination together, it makes, uh, it makes you see the depth that actually in your current laptop, when you are looking into this talk, you don't have it. But with simulated reality devices, you will get that depth. Um, at the moment, we are working with, well, we are doing a lot of tests, and sometimes I feel a bit sad because I cannot mention the names of those companies, but you will get a lot of information on a later stage. We are doing a lot of tests, uh, tests with remote assistance, uh, with uh, robot assistance, um, robotic assistance uh, surgery. So at the moment, uh, we are testing, we, we are really testing and validating and conducting a lot of research where uh, robotic surgery can uh, benefit of simulate reality. And why is, this why, why is this important, right? The surgeons usually, they, they, they have this, when, with the current methods, they have this mental remapping, reshaping kind of uh, information. So when they look into the screens, for instance, what, what is left is actually right, and what is right is actually left. And that there's not that time to really understand what's going on there. So if they actually look into our screen, they can really just see things they put their vision inside of the body of the patient. So we can just gather that information, put their eyes, I know that is very, eh, a bit uh, metaphoric, but we can put those eyes inside of the body of the patient and really understand immediately, fast, and fast is very important in surgery, uh, what's going on there. So we are doing a lot of tests. We not, we've seen, as so probably you saw in the news, that there are also a lot of tests going with virtual reality, there are also with augmented reality, and that's great because we need to test new technologies to see how can we improve in the end of patient care, right? So yeah, we're doing a lot of tests with that. Um, of course, there are other use cases, and before it has been mentioned, uh, for instance, with augmented reality, but we are doing a lot of um, other use cases, maybe also in education, or in robotic surgery, as I mentioned before, or um, we have partners like Barco, who are integrating our technology in surgery monitors. So this is not something that we are actually speaking about the future. This is actually really happening at the moment, and that's why I'm so proud to come here and explain today about this. Uh, another example out here, what, what's the 5G picture? And why is this important? Why we are here today? Well, connectivity, it becomes key, right? The digital world is becoming more remote every day. And this is a true case. I got a call, I think last week, told me, Juana, we need to offer education to our surgeons, but I cannot organize an event for obvious reasons. What do we do? How can I provide the same experience of everyone would be in the same place, but without being in the same place? How can I put those eyes, as we spoke before with, with the surgery, how can I put their eyes into the same environment? Simulated reality is the solution. And again, remember, without any headsets. So I said, you know what? We can conduct such thing, and with with you guys, with the 5G hub, we can work on a solution where we can stream, 3D stream that information. So the surgeon in Maastricht, for instance, he will be teaching remote real time. Yeah? So that's, we go for, for, for everything. And then we stream that information through 3D 
uh, cameras thanks to 5G solution, and then it got deployed through simulate reality devices. It can be laptops, it can be monitors, it can be everything. Um, that's possible. We are organizing that, and probably you'll hear much more for the upcoming months. So, again, it's not abstract information, it's happening. Another one, uh, actually, Stefan showed the video from, uh, from the original content company. This is one of the applications that already runs in Simulate Reality. Um, we are really happy to work with them. Like, those students, they just step inside, and they, they look into the screen, and they understand what's going on. There's no need of explanation. It's totally effortless. And uh, you can see a big smile there. And you know, if they have a question, they, they just move, they put their head, and they ask. They don't need to take anything off and on. I think it's just more comfortable. Um, so why, why us, right? Again, this is accessible. This is on the market. This is working, it's comfortable, it's hygienic. And I can totally picture the future doctors with a laptop walking, saying, hey, look at this surgery I'm performing today. So the nurse or the other doctor is looking into the image, and then they totally understand. So the medium of communication and interpretation doesn't need to be very special, because it's so easy. It's just a medium of communication with setting the same expectations, everyone in the same place. So again, uh, even though it's a reality, and we are speaking about the future of, of healthcare, this is going on, right? So we need people like you guys, probably you already have a lot of ideas, to even bring more the future, to really move it, to really speed it up. Um, so I want to thank you all, and yeah, let's see what simulated reality brings. Thank you. Thank you, oh, thank you, Iwala. And, and if we talk about this simulated reality, um, what kind of application areas are, are more possible? What is possible with this, if we philosophize for a moment? Yeah, so this morning I got a question from a manufacturer, automotive manufacturer company, and they said, well, we want to have the cockpit of the future. Oh. We just want our, uh, auto well, the driver to just, you know, move their hand, see the 3D image and just do something on the air, touchless, in 3D, without any, obviously, headsets, because, yeah, he's driving. So I can totally imagine something like that. Oh, so it's, it's possible in all kinds of areas. As long as there's a device, we can integrate our technology without any troubles. It's really awesome. And, and um, the 5G hub, why is it so important for the Dimenko to join as well? Yeah, so I was, as I said, we can't do this alone, right? We are, this is Brainford region. The 5G guys, uh, the 5G hub, they, they have very smart ideas. They offer us the connectivity. I explained some use cases that are possible at the moment. But these use cases can evolve a lot thanks to our work together, to the point that we can do a lot of remote uh, collaboration. And I think that's a key subject, especially for the circumstances of today's day. So yeah, we are really excited to work with you guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. I should leave. Thank you. Thank you all. So that was it. The webinar about 5G, the future of health. So if you had a question and we weren't able to answer them, go to the 5ghub.nl and just answer your question. We're really easy to reach. So thank you for joining and we hope to see you next time.